Welcome everyone watching to the safe space where we learn how to train and feed our dogs better. And today's topic is highly requested. I'm so excited to talk about this because I think it's going to help hundreds of thousands of pet parents, if not more. And the topic today is going to be all about pet allergies, itchy skin, chronic ear infections, rashes, and I am so lucky, we are so lucky today to have a very special guest, uh, Dr. Andrew Jones, veterinarian with over, gosh, over 30 years of experience now, I think, with my research surgery, correct? That is correct, yes. Yeah, author, speaker, um, fellow content creator, so welcome. Thank you for being here. Awesome. Thanks, Rachel. I'm glad to be here. Got to be part of a live stream, which is awesome. And I can get questions from your followers and you know, hopefully help them with some of their specific dog health issues, especially allergies. Yeah. Allergies are a really, uh, really uh, popular, like I said, topic, something that is impacting hundreds of thousands of dogs out there today. So let's just jump into it. Let's start a little bit on the foundation and the basics, because I know there's a lot of people here who've just been trying to navigate this for years at this point and are feeling really hopeless. So let's just start a little bit back and talk about what are some of the types of allergies that are common that our dogs are suffering from, like environmental, seasonal, et cetera. Sure, Rachel. Well, first I want to start out when I was practicing as a veterinarian, like the number one reason I would see a dog coming into the practice, the dog is sick. It was for some type of allergy, like more than anything else. So they're prevalent and now they've got to the point where they're becoming more prevalent, like where we're seeing more dogs with allergies. So what are the types? So the most common cause we would call atopy or environmental allergy. That's where your dog is allergic to something inhale it's something environmental then you have about 15 percent of dogs have a, a food allergy of some type you, your dog can obviously have both an environment environmental or food some can be allergic to parasites or just have parasites so you can have things such as flea allergy dermatitis and they're also even like contact allergies so when you think of some of the things in your house for instance some of these chemicals etc your dog can come in contact with those and then have these itching scratching red irritated skin etc yeah um i even have uh one of my dogs has a really strong uh allergy to fleas and ticks so if there's even like a flea in the area he just gets these chronic yeah. ear infections out of it so there's definitely a lot of things that can cause these allergic reactions and i guess even to go more basic than that what is an allergic response my understanding is it's really an immune uh, immune system response is that correct it is. So if you look at the example of atopy or this environmental allergy, so you have, like, say, a, a type of protein called an antigen that we used to think it was inhaled, where, say, your dog would inhale pollen or something. Now we know more, there's a breakdown in the skin barrier, so just the lining of the skin. This little protein penetrates in through the skin and then triggers this whole inflammatory cascade the immune system overreacts, you get these inflammatory cells, and then you just get that red inflamed skin and your dog is itching and scratching and has that hair loss. And it's unfortunate, we're just seeing more of it now. Yeah, it's definitely becoming more prevalent. It's something yeah. I'm asked about every single day. So, um, and some of the common symptoms we're looking at, dermatitis, ear infections, chewing, like you said, hair loss are things that our dogs are suffering from. So one of the most, before we talk about some of the at-home remedies that you have yeah. seen success in, in some of the most extreme cases, all the way down to the mo more mild cases, before we get to that, I do want to talk about a common medication that pet parents are prescribed from their conventional veterinarian, which is Apoquil and some potential problems with that. You know, my understanding of that, and I'll let you uh, kind of back that up, is that Apoquil can be problematic because of the C immediate general problem with it, if I understand it correctly, is that it's not necessarily um, fixing the problem. It's kind of just dampening the symptoms and then the potential side effects uh, can be really problematic going forward. Is, is that kind of a good high level summary of Apoquil? It is. So it's, it's a really successful drug right now. There's like millions of dogs are on it daily because it mm. can for sure suppress the itch. 
But the way it's working is it is it's acting as an immunosuppressant or it's in interrupting part of the immune response to block that level of itchiness. And if you actually look at the drug insert of Apoquil and go and see, okay, what are the potential side effects? There's GI stuff like vomiting and diarrhea, but it does say in some dogs, it will suppress the immune system. You might see more dogs getting a disease called Demodex or it's a type of mange, which come from the immune system being suppressed. And it says, even says in the drug insert, if your dog has cancer, you might see worsening of cancer symptoms. So, I mean, they're acknowledging it is immunosuppressive. So if we've got our dogs on that, especially throughout their lives, I mean, clearly your immune system is chronically suppressed. You're much more likely to get sick and or seriously sick because of it. So, and I understand, like I understand having, especially having seen many clients have had dogs have chronic allergies. It's pretty darn frustrating. And at some times it's like, you want to do something just to relieve the itch, but there are a whole bunch of other steps you can take first before you have to resort to some strong convention medication like this. Right. And I mean, and I think that's kind of what stood out to me was that we're already talking about a dog that's suffering from an allergy response, which is an immune response. And then we're medicating with something like Apoquil, which can also be an immunosuppressant. So to me, just as a researched pet parent, I'm, I'm kind of looking at that like, okay, this can't be great long-term per se. Um, and I also want to give a quick disclaimer is that we are, Dr. Jones and I are not um, here to prescribe, treat, diagnose, give medical advice. This is all for informational purposes. And really, uh, this is a, a resource for you. This video will be a resource for you to share with your local veterinarian uh, that, you, that you're working with as well. Just have to give that little little disclaimer. So let's just jump into at-home remedies. Like what are some things, if, if my dog is suffering from allergies, chronic ear infections, what are some of the first things you start looking at uh, and doing to help? Well, I always suggest first is that if no one's ever done, like doing a proper food trial first, yeah. just because even though it's only about 15% of dogs, it, it's a difficult thing for many pet parents to have first done. So mm -hmm. That's the first feeding and, and a proper food trial just means you're feeding, try to go for six weeks or you're really strict for six weeks. You're feeding a, a unique type of protein your dog has never had before, i.e. something like turkey. And it may be the best of any of all the, of any of the foods to feed are, are going to be an actual homemade food, like two or three simple ingredients you're going to feed for a six week period of time. If you can stick to that is ideal to rule out food first, because if it was if it was food, great. You'd be like, ah, I've solved the problem. And then the next thing, regardless whether you've done that or not, is I always suggest you need to start in a good quality essential fatty acid, but it need because these are great anti-inflammatories, so important for the skin, but it needs to be at a high enough dose. So many of the suggested doses are a lot lower. And what I'm finding is if you're looking at, say, dosing a dog with a fish oil, you're looking at somewhere between 500 to 1,000 milligrams for 10 pounds of body weight daily. If you're looking at something like krill oil, you're looking at lower doses of about 500 milligrams uh, for 20 pounds of body weight daily. And you need to, and that's something you want to have your dog on. And you're not going to see a result in a week. You need to be giving that for at least eight weeks before you can, okay, is it helping? So that's like the first thing I'll say with every dog that's got any type of allergy symptom. The next thing would be some form of a natural antihistamine. Um, one in particular, there's lots of things I can mention, but I'm just going to mention about four or five things to get you guys to focus on. There's one called quercetin or quercetin. It's actually a flavonoid. It's found in apple peel. It's found in red onion, but it's a great natural antihistamine. And it's been used successfully in people. We're actually seeing some studies showing to be uh, beneficial for people that have some of these respiratory allergies. So you can get it as a supplement form. We're looking at doses of about two milligrams, um, two mil one to two milligrams per pound daily. So my dog's about 20, 25 pounds. You get about 25 milligrams. Probably do that twice a day for her size. Um, those are the first two things for sure to look at. Next thing there is a herbal tincture or supplement called licorice root. So it's considered the natural sort of prednisone or corticosteroid. So for instance, for years, and even for many, for many, many dogs still, 
steroids or prednisone are sort of the mainstay initially to suppress inflammation. Like your dog's got this big allergic response and vet practice wise, you could give a shot of like say dexamethasone and two hours later, the dog stopped itching. You're like, ah, oh, I've solved the problem. But you haven't, you just suppress the immune system. You essentially push the under, many of the underlying causes of that allergy deeper. And then the, these steroids have their whole host of side effects. So then something like licorice root, and it is only meant for short-term use, somewhere between 10 to 14 days, but it's considered the natural corticosteroid. And I had one, I had one of my last dogs, he had allergies, especially at night when he start to sort of really start to lick his groin, have troubles going to sleep. I mean, I would be giving him a half a mil of this tincture and he's a fairly small dog. And within about an hour that would stop his licking. So the dose of the licorice root is sort of about a half a mil per 20 pounds of body weight twice a day. And it's meant initially short term, 10 to 14 days, just to control the itching while you ha while you have your dog on that anti-inflammatory, the omega-3 fatty acid, along with something like that keratin, that, you know, that natural antihistamine. One of the other supplements I want to mention, there's a product called beta cetosterol. So it's actually isolated from soy. So it's a type of fat that's isolated from soy. And the interesting thing about beta cetosterol is there actually is, there are studies where it was actually being studied for dogs that have atopy. This is this environmental allergy. And they actually found it to be effective. It was like up to 30% of dogs, which, but it was huge. It's one of the few natural products you can see was actually specifically being studied for atopy. I'm like, wow. So I was pretty excited when I first read about that. And I've since been able to try it. My brother's dog, for instance, he has a border collie that happens to have allergies. So he's a great dog to try some of the supplements on. Um, but when you get this, this beta cetosterol, typically it's in a little capsule and it's in, for instance, the one I got locally here where I live, it comes in within flax oil. So it's in a little capsule in flax oil. And they were looking at doses of about two milligrams per pound um, twice a day, but it's fairly safe. It's not going to do any harm. But once again, it's something you'd need to be giving for at least a month before you could assess, like, is it helping or not, right? So there's a, a but I mean, I know I'm giving you guys a bunch of different remedies there. Um, another one that is seen to work well um, for my brother's dog in particular, and for many of the pet parents um, who, are, who are following us and have submitted feedback, is Camadile or CBD. I know it's going to, most of you in the United States are actually able to get uh, CBD, right? Everybody can get CBD so long as it's 0.4% or less THC. But what we're finding with the camadile, the CBD, it's a really effective natural anti-inflammatory. And exactly how it plays a role, like how it's going to modify those allergic symptoms, no one's 100% clear, but many of the dogs are responding to it. And it's one, you know, once again, you've got to give it for, for a period of time, at least a month where you can say, okay, is it helping or not? But it's typically for about a month. Um, and what we found with my brother's dog, he's been on a, on a combination of the omega-3 fatty acids on the krill oil. He's on a you know pretty limited ingredient food. He's on the cannabis oil and he's on the CBD or the cannabis oil. And that's that and along with the quercetin. So he's on kind of those are the main core supplements. And that's done a really good job of keeping his allergies, allergies in check. Yeah. So there's a bunch of things there. Um, and when you hear all the remedies, I was just going to mention, Rachel, just for everyone watching is it's not, you don't start with everything at once. Typically I stay, say, start with one or two things first, right? And, you know, say for instance, a severe break itchiness is happening. I'm like, okay, I've got to like take that inflammation down. Maybe you start it with some licorice root, control the inflammation, and then start it with the omega-3 fat, fatty acid first. Maybe you go for a month after that and okay, there's no big change. Okay, well then maybe start to add in the quercetin, but just do it sequentially, just, you know, one or two things at a time. You're not using them all at once. And it is hard and frustrating and challenging, but it really can be worth it, especially if long-term you can start to see things slowly working. And, and I've found with many of the pet parents have been able to say, lower the doses of some of the conventional drugs, like say they've been on apical, they can maybe not give it as often or say they've been on prednisone or the steroids 
they can lower the dose or not give those steroids as often in some cases. And that's kind of what you want, right? Where you can try your stuff alternatively along with, if you need to use stuff conventionally, okay, but maybe use it a lot lower dose and a lot less often. Yeah, that, that was going to be my exact question next was, should we do all of these things at once or start gradual? So um, I I would feel the same as you mentioned is to kind of go gradual, make one or two changes at a time at most and, and give it time, give it time to work. Um, so I will make sure that the the supplements that you're suggesting suggesting and discussing are linked below. I know that you have a website that can feature a lot of products. Are any of these products on your website, the the quercetin and things like that? The the few there's a, we have a omega three fatty acid supplement is, and the the camad oil or the CBD is. Awesome. So our one our e commerce site is drjonesnaturalpat.com, mm -hmm. um, and that features a few of those products for sure. Is um, that in Canada only, or is that U.S. as well? That's U.S. actually. Okay, awesome. It is very pretty, cool. It is U.S. Yes. It, very good. It's yeah, it's easier in the U.S. to ship cannabis oil than. Canada for some reason. But. Interesting. Interesting. So I think I think this is really helpful and it aligns with everything I've really researched over the years. And in fact, I take quercetin for myself uh, and mm -hmm. I have personally seen a benefit in my allergy Labrador uh, with using CBD. He gets a low dose um, every day now and mm -hmm. he's had chronic skin issues that years, he's almost, he turns 14 this year, but years ago uh, before I kind of went on this path of more natural holistic options. I had them on a prescription food and the uh, steroids and allergy shots, like all these things. And nothing really helped him that much. And the side effects just weren't worth it. So um, over time, I've been able to transfer to a lot of the things you're suggesting as well and seeing remarkable results. So that's that's really uh that's, that's really nice to hear, but I kind of want to go back to diet because you mentioned yeah. kind of step one is talking about uh, feeding a more limited ingredient diet. Can you, I, I know that you have free recipes. I've seen you in your awesome videos. By the way, anybody watching, uh, Dr. Jones has an incredible YouTube channel. You're all over social media at Veterinary Secrets. It's all linked below. Um, but I know you have recipes, but can you talk a little bit about the diets that you really like for dogs? I know that you feed a more fresh diet um, and maybe even that recipe that you've you've shared before. So a couple of things. First of all, my sort of take on it, mm -hmm. and I try, try to apply that to my own dog, is I, I, I think she's probably better if I fed her mostly homemade food and or raw food. But I'm not 100% ready to commit to just solely that. So I'm like, okay. So what I try to do is just feed less kibble, make some more food at home, also feed her some raw. So one, for example, and a simple, because I get many, many questions around, like a, the concern is around balanced food. And when, even when I was in practice, that was always my issue. I was con because that's what we get fed to us as veterinarians. Like it's gotta be balanced. You've gotta have every single nutrient there. This dog is going to be lacking some nutrient and then gasp. Some horrible disease is going to happen. Turns out that's actually not the case. And <clears throat> there's lots and lots of people that, for instance, just feed raw food to their dogs. And that's it. They don't any form of supplements. They might even if they might just grind bones to have additional calcium and that's it. And those are some long living, pretty darn healthy dogs. So I think you can be pretty sick. You can feel pretty comfortable if you're going to make your dog's food, for instance, you, Recently, I made a stew where I just used a simple, I just used beef protein. I actually used a sweet potato. I used, as far as the veggie, I actually threw in some, had some kale. And I didn't really add any salt or pepper, any spices. Like, that was it. And that's what, that's what Tula has as her meal. Like, it's a pretty simple, like, just think of simple ingredients that you would feed yourself. And for the most part, the same thing are, are fine to feed your dog. Likewise with raw food, I it's easiest just I just get the prepackaged frozen raw patties, but I have just fed just strictly raw food. I, mean, I had a trick chicken breast, it's frozen. I just defrost it in, in the fridge so it's chewable and I'll cut in chunks. And yep, she loves her raw food, raw chicken. And 
but wait, Dr. Jones, my dog's going to get salmonella. <laughs> right. <laughs> my dog's no. going to get E. coli. They're going to get sick. Yeah. What do you say and to that? that? And that's it. And I heard that so often, especially in practice. And honestly, I don't think once, we never once saw a dog that had salmonella or a dog that had E. coli from eating raw. At least surprisingly. I mean, because that's what you see. Like, is it a risk? For sure, if you're going to leave chicken outside on the counter and let it grow bacteria. But if you... <laughs> That's, that that's, a crow that just, that's a crow that just flew by. Oh. Oh. Um, if you just, if you just like it's frozen and then you defrost it, it's completely fine that way. It's for what I've seen for most dogs. Yeah. Um, and then they've been, have done really well. So as far as specific recipe, I have more in-depth recipes. If you were to strictly go to feeding your dog, like a home diet, there's a few things you do want to ensure that are part of that food and you didn't feed anything else. Um, and I do have a couple specific recipes that ensure that it's balanced, but the main principle there is if you're, is making sure your dog has enough additional calcium in that diet. Um, so for instance, then you need to add in additional calcium, probably the biggest thing, make sure you've got enough of a balanced fat. And, but for the most part, you don't need to actually add many other supplements. If you've got in, you know, a good quality protein, some form of veggie, and if you are going to be using a carbohydrate, sort of a healthier one, that's just brown rice or sweet potato, um, then already you've got a pretty well-balanced diet that most dogs really thrive on. Yeah. Um, so kind of going back, thank you for that little, uh, I always, I always somehow bring these lives back to food because that's, it's a big passion of mine, but, um, I'll, I'll have all of that linked down below for those interested, but I think specific to allergies, I think what you were saying before is when you're thinking about taking this journey to help treat and resolve your dog's allergies, chronic ear infections, skin, itchy skin, uh, starting with a more limited ingredient diet. And that can even, I think you would agree, be in the form of a kibble. Because a lot of people watching are feeding a kibble. And I think that there are a lot of kibble options. I have my dog food list linked down below. And I know, Dr. Jones, you probably have some that you like as well. Uh, and most of the brands that I would feed if I was feeding a kibble are pretty limited ingredient. And then you also said something I think is important is picking a protein that's more of a novel protein or new to your dog type of protein. I think you mentioned maybe a turkey if your dog usually eats beef or a venison or maybe even rabbit could be really interesting. Mm -hmm. Exactly. When you look at what, what is your dog most likely allergic to if it is food? It's to the protein. So that's all we know that you've got, you want to switch the protein. And the other thing to mention is that many people used to think that, you know, if my dog has a food allergy, I feed him something for two weeks and then I see it pop up. Where typically that's not the case. It's more like you've, you've fed it for might be a few years and then you see your dog get sensitized to it. And it's much the same thing as people, you know, you eat peanut butter once you react, you've eaten it for 10 years and then you're like, okay, react. So that's the other thing. But the point being there is yes, what, what, what Rachel is saying, like the importance of feeding that a different protein that your dog hasn't had and then sticking to that, right? So they're yeah. not able to get the protein they may be allergic to. Yeah. And, and to what you just said, th that is actually a reason that for dogs that aren't kind of going through this um, allergy immune response. Um, I love the idea of rotating proteins with different, you know, maybe feed a beef and then a chicken and then a turkey uh, so that they're less likely to develop an intolerance uh, to a protein. So that's really interesting that you brought that up because I think that that's something that a lot of people get nervous about because they think that there's this misnomer out there that our dog needs to eat the same thing every day, day in, day out for their entire life. Um, and at least my thought process, I'd love to hear yours, is uh, that could be further from the could be further from the truth, and that the variety is the spice of life, and uh, giving our dogs the opportunity to eat different foods, whether it be a different protein or different meal toppers that are pet safe, uh, is really valuable for their longevity. And that actually, that's a great point because veterinary practice wise, it was recommended to us that you just get on this one food, your dog does well on it, you just stay on it. There was no discussion around, right? But clearly, because we know, like for instance, with food allergies, right? It takes a few years for that allergy to develop. So if that's all you eat constantly, 
Like you're just asking your body to eventually get sensitized to that. So I, I fully care. And that's what I do with my own. I did it with my last couple of dogs and I'm now doing it with Tula. I do, I rotate her protein source. So she's never eating every three or four months, something changes. And so it is a different food. It's a different protein. And I really think that does make the best sense as far as decreasing likely you're going to sensitize to it and then have an allergic reaction or have allergies to it. Yeah. And then for those pet parents that are really worried about missing certain micronutrients or macronutrients, this just helps ensure that they're getting a little bit of everything. And I saw a comment um, in the chat around prescription pet foods, because I know a lot of pet parents are put on these prescription pet foods uh, to help with their immune response. Um, what are some of your thoughts on prescription pet foods, which I know we have to tread lightly here, but. Right. It is. So um, obviously there's certain prescription foods, like say your dog has had a type of liver disease or say your dog has a type of um, bladder stone. Okay, fair enough. Like there's certain specific developed prescription foods um, which your dog may need to be on. But for many of the dogs, for instance, there are many alternatives. And my issue with many of the prescription foods, if you actually go ahead and look at the ingredients, you look at the ingredient list, they're not great quality ingredients. So then the issue becomes, and you can look at many uh, veterinarians have much the same opinion. So the issue becomes, okay, maybe it's treating that specific health condition, but then what else is your dog not getting? And what other condition is he going to get? Because he's now on you know, some of those, what I would consider lesser quality ingredients. So yeah, it's, I'm not a big yeah. fan of many of the prescription foods. Yeah, I, I agree with you. And it, it is a sensitive topic because I know that uh, there are pet parents that do see, um, see positive results from them. I think after looking into it and researching it and asking a lot of veterinarians that the, the consensus is exactly what you said, that generally speaking, there are usually better options, meaning better ingredients that can achieve the same results. And something that I find interesting is that prescription pet foods, generally speaking, are meant to be uh, temporary limited time diet. Whereas I think a lot of us are stuck in this rat race of we need to feed this for the rest of their life. And they weren't originally intended to do that. Exactly. And, and even the, the, the fact that they're called prescription, that's a marketing term, yeah. right? They're not, you don't need to have a veterinarian sign a piece of paper for you to get that food. Yeah, I know. Um, yeah. Okay, so 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 back to back to allergies. Um, what are let's talk about a couple common irritants. Uh, in our homes that a lot of us may not realize could be causing or worsening our dog's symptoms. Uh, for a couple examples I can think of are like those wall scent plugins yeah. or those scent sprays are filled with common skin irritants for both dogs and humans. What are a couple other things we should look out for? So, and the other thing I just want to mention, I'm glad you brought it up, is just because our dogs are walking in the car, Bit or walking in the floor and every their faces licking everything and they're so much they're close to the ground and anything that's concentrating in your house just concentrating so much more in them yeah. um, a couple of things that say would concern me or some say for instance these fire retardant chemicals which are in things like sofas and other mattresses parts right so okay so those are like leaching out and because you're con and they're going to be much higher concentration in your dog than you. Um, things like formaldehyde, which is in lots of building products, is leaching out of other parts of, like, say, particle board, part of how many people's houses have been built with parts of that. It's not just that it's there as an, environment, as an environmental toxin, but it's just concentrating so much more in your dog because, of, you know, they're walking on the carpet and the floor, and then they're grooming themselves or licking their paws. And any time we test for levels of environmental toxins or contaminants, or even as Rachel mentioned, things that we plug into the wall and diffuse to make things smell better, that much, typically that much higher in our dogs than ourselves because of what they do. They're walking around and they're licking themselves and then it concentrates that much more. So you can sure see a clear link between our dogs being healthier, unhealthy, and some of those like toxins as well. Yeah. And I like that you brought up um, dogs walking around. I think one thing I've read 
uh, before is sometimes it's simple as after taking your dogs on walk, if your dog on a walk is just wiping their paws down with just a warm, wet rag every time can be helpful because um, if your neighbors are spraying with pesticides, for example, or there's salt on the ground if it's snowy, those can just be uh, topical irritants for our dogs and just kind of keeping their paws clean can be helpful. Um, what are your thoughts about bathing? I, I know that a lot of um, veterinarians or pet parents are concerned about stripping out the oils. I've also read that dogs really suffering with allergies can see benefits from like monthly bathing to kind of refresh and cleanse off the allergens that might be sticking on their coat. What are your thoughts on that? And that's a, that's a good question. First, just the, you mentioned about the cloth. So that's actually one of the like suggestions for allergic dogs too, because they walk around outside and they've got these big grass rinses and grass on their paws Yeah. and just wipe their paws when they come in from being outside, because that's going to get rid of those as well. Um, but as far as in the regular bathing, so if you think about the allergens being on the surface of the skin, then if you can wash those off, you're going to decrease the chance your dog is going to have this more serious allergic reaction. So you don't necessarily, you don't, what you can do is just using water. So the one way about it, for sure, there's these natural oils in the skin. And if you're going to use a hard shampoo, you're going to potentially dry out the skin, make the skin irritated. But you can just use water to rin rinse them off. And you could easily do that. I mean, you could do that if it was just water, you potentially do that daily. Um, and then what we're finding is, is especially these dogs have ongoing chronic allergies, more regular bathing for sure is important, but you don't need to be using these harsh shampoos. You can just use water, for instance, to start, right? As a simple, simple way to wash off some of those allergens, less stripless allergens, less itching. Uh, yeah. And you're just at least helping to manage it. Right? Yeah. I think that's, I, I agree with that a lot because there's this, just this misnomer that we like bathing our dogs is going to dry out their skin. And as you said, mo probably most of the popular pet shampoos, conditioners out there probably will because they're filled with sulfates and fragrances and coloring and dyes that, that are harsh on the skin. And it's so sad because they add that in to appeal to us as humans, to make it more foamy, to make it smell like vanilla cupcake when dogs don't need that. So I use a really mild, very limited ingredient uh, shampoo on my dogs, and I've never seen any issues with that. Um, and then thinking about um, ear infections, I know that's a common thing, and I know that you have a lot of really good content and videos on ear infections. You have, and it's funny, my mom actually sent me my mom sent me one of your videos, not knowing that we've connected. She's like, have you seen this? Cause her dog uh, was struggling with some ear infections and it was the one where you, yeah, I know. I was like, yes, I, I actually know who he is, mom. She's like, oh my gosh. But, um, but you had an ear infection uh, recipe that you used, uh, I think on your dog. Can you tell me a little bit more about that? It was a more gentle option than what you might get at a conventional vet. So the majority of the dogs, if they, I mean, first, most of the ear infections, like Rachel's saying, most have an underlying allergic basis to them. So if we're seeing these dogs with ear infections, just think of the inner, the ear is just an extension of the skin, which sort of makes sense. It's not sort of its unique, separate thing unto itself. Yeah. So then the next thing, the most common cause, though, if, for instance, I go into the practice and you put a little Q-tip in there and you swab what's coming out of the ear, typically it's sort of this blackish debris. You look under a microscope, you're going to see little round balls called yeast. So most of the dog ear infections are actually caused by yeast. More than if you're looking at the underlying cause of the allergy, then this allows the ear gets inflamed, yeast overgrow, and that's why your dog is itching. So the couple things to know, first of all, apple cider vinegar, for instance, is a great antifungal. And you can, but the thing with vinegar can be pretty irritating to inflamed skin. So one of the recipes I've used is I just make up some, a cup of green tea. I let it sit for 15 or 20 minutes and cool. Then I would add into that one cup of green tea. I would add in two tablespoons of apple cider vinegar. The green tea is antibacterial. It also has some antifungal properties and, and it's a bit anti-inflammatory. The apple cider vinegar, it's a, it's a quite impressive. It's really effective 
as far as being antifungal, but also work, can also be effective against some of the bacteria. And the two of them together, the other thing about apple cider vinegar, there's a there's an ear infection called Pseudomonas, which it's one of the more complicated. So it's a type of bacteria called Pseudomonas, which can be a really difficult ear infection to treat. One of the few things that is effective against Pseudomonas is vinegar, right, which is a completely natural product. Most of the bacteria, most of the antibiotics we have don't work for Pseudomonas, but vinegar does. Who knew? So this random remedy is you're taking one cup of green tea, adding in two tablespoons of apple cider vinegar, and you can just draw it up in a little, get yourself a little syringe, putting in five to 10 drops into that affected ear, doing that twice a day. Uh, somewhere between you know, five to seven days is often enough to treat yeast. You just got to make sure you've got to really rub the base of the ear really well. And it does help to initially wipe out a bunch, as much debris as possible first. Um, but I've had a lot of dogs just respond to that alone, uh, especially dogs that have yeast. Yeah. What What are your thoughts on Zymox? That's a popular one. Um, or the keto something something ear wash I've seen. I, if you're familiar. I don't know if you're familiar. I haven't, see, I, I haven't used it to say, and I know a bunch of people have said it. I've read like both things where it's been really effective. Yeah. Mm. Um, and I, I think my backing up to dogs with ear infections is lots of the, like say for instance, the veterinary ear treatments involve, typically they would involve a steroid, an anti, an antibiotic of some type and a commercial antifungal. So they sort of try to treat all things at once. And, and it's actually, I, better for your dog if you just use sort of one thing that's going to treat, you know, one, one, what's most likely causing the infection. So using something that's antifungal to treat the fungus is better than using these combination products. Because what happens if you keep in, keep introducing stuff into the ear that's sort of meant to treat everything, you're going to build like resistant bacteria, for instance, and then you can have a real big problem where uh, how then do you treat the ear infection? So that's you, you really can help if you sort of start to use those natural remedies where you're just treating the one thing. And if your dog responds, great. I don't think the other thing, um, I don't know, Rachel, if you saw the video where I used some of the topical. So for instance, in the veterinary medication, many of the veterinary ear treatments, uh, the one antifungal is called clotrimazole. And that same antifungal is, you can get that over the counter. Um, in any pharmacy, it's still under the brand name Caniston, for instance, but it's also made as a generic form. Um, and interesting, when I was in practice, I remember having a nurse who had a golden retriever with chronic ear infections. So she just looked at seeing, you know, so you know, she would, we would send her home with this $50 bottle of ear treatment. And she looked and said, oh, well, this is the antifungal. So we'd swab it. And it's, she's like, well, you know, I can just go to the pharmacy here and I can buy this giant thing of clotrimazole. And it's going to last me a year. And I treat my dog for three or three or four days and he's cured. Um, so I've had a lot of people say that was, has been quite effective. Two or three days of topical clotrimazole, which they picked out at a pharmacy and it's a fraction of the cost. Um, yeah. As another, and that's a home remedy. It's not a natural one, but um, for lots of dogs, that's been really effective too. Yeah. And I think with all of this, you mentioned this earlier uh, uh, when you were talking about Apoquil or steroid use is that with using these remedies or at home DIY res uh, fixes, it may just be that your dog uses less of the harsher, more conventional options. And that may just be where your dog is for a while. And for me, at least, if that was my pet, I would, I would, I would still be happy with that, right? Like, I don't think that either of us are saying, like, we need to just stop all conventional veterinary stuff throw it in the trash and then go completely natural and just watch our dog kind of suffer through it. I think what we're saying is here are some more natural options that hopefully eventually over time, we're able to kind of wean off of the more harsh conventional options like the steroids or the Apoquil, hopefully all the way, but it may take a little bit and it may be where you're using half and half for a while. Is that a good uh, summary? Yeah, that's a great, yeah, exactly. And, and that's all, even in practice, when I practice, it was always a bit of, okay, here's conventionally, this is all the stuff we got taught. And okay, then here's the, right. And here's a whole bunch, here's some alternative options. And I obviously, and as I sort of gotten more and more into alternative treatments, I mean, that's obviously been more of my focus, but realizing they're not, 
the reasons ultimately you're there to help like your dog feel better without having you know serious long-term side effects so can we incorporate a bit of everything but knowing full well that you know these holistic treatments they're not going to work as fast um, for most most cases but many of them are pretty darn safe and there's something that you can safely give to your dog on a more long-term basis but if you need to use something conventional because there's a big flare-up well yes then you know use that right because you don't you don't want your dog to be in pain yeah another topic i want to talk about that does relate pretty uh specifically to allergies and and as an immunosuppressant are traditional commercial flea and tick products and like the the monthly preventatives or the topical that we put on can we talk a little bit about one, your thoughts on those, and two, how those may actually contribute to our dog's ongoing allergies and ear infections. Oh, the flea and dick. So they're, <laughs> I mean, it's funny because I remember being in practice when they first came out. I'm like, oh, it's great. We have something topically. These used okay. to be. Um, so they sure are effective. Mm -hmm. But as with anything, like any insecticide you're going to put on topically or you're going to give to your dog orally. I mean, they are an insecticide that's killing an animal. It's killing flea. So either you say something like Bovecto, I mean, you're going to give that pill to your dog. You're going to ask it to kill fleas for a long period of time. But you're, there's a drug your dog is metabolizing that's staying within his blood system for an extended period of time. Or some of the topicals like Advantage or Frontline. Likewise, too, yes, it gets absorbed into the skin and then it spreads through say that fatty layer in the skin but some of that insecticide is then getting metabolized and you're asking your dog's liver to deal with it you're asking it to go through say the kidneys to deal with it and are most dogs going to be okay it seems to be but not not all and i think all of us can agree we, we would not want to be taking an insecticide long term of anything whether it's orally or topically and and I think many of you would probably would would agree with your own dog that this kind of makes sense. Like there's there's gonna be some risk, and that's sort of my thought. Like you're like you're then asking your dog's organs to metabolize that drug, those drugs, and yeah, that can lead to unintended consequences, like yeah. immune system that's not responding as it should be, and then maybe it leads to some more serious secondary disease. Yeah, that's kind of my thought. And again, there's no shame for what option you choose to do for your for your dog. But I think it's an important topic. And thank you for sharing your thoughts. Uh, because it honestly, it wasn't something I was knowledgeable about, you know, I don't know, five, six years ago, that there can be some really serious long term consequences of using these monthly preventatives. And there are more natural uh, options that we can use, which we're not going to deep dive in this video. Those I'll have videos linked down below from both of us that uh, you can deep dive on that. And maybe we'll come back one day together and talk about that. But I do think it's because of the immunosuppressant potential side effects of those. And that is all linked to allergies and inflammation in the body. I think that it was an important thing to talk about. A couple other things that I was thinking about as it relates specifically to scratchy, itchy dogs, allergies, ear infections is overall stress and stress management because uh, stress affects the immune system, both in humans and canines. And I think, you know, that's something that's maybe a little bit more out there, but something to consider for those of you watching that are like, I, I just want to do anything and everything I can to help my dog. I, I truly believe that there is power and benefit in finding ways to relieve our personal stress, we'll find a little bit more Zen, uh, even through just mental health support and even exercise. And then the same for our dogs, because you lower their stress in their environment by giving them, you know, brain games, mental activity, exercise, and just lowering your personal stress, I believe could be really helpful in overall health, not even just with allergies. What are, what are your thoughts on that? Well, they know, for instance, what you just said, Richard, they know there's a correlation between the bacteria in your gut, the probiotics and yeah. anxiety, for instance. So they know like, there's so many more things going on than we obviously fully understand. And many, it is by many, um, some practitioners are even actually using anti-anxiety medication also to treat these dogs who have allergies. Interesting. So, you know, like a, 
play. So if we can take away, because so that makes sense to me. I mean, all of a sudden you're anxious and you're like, okay, I, if you're had lots of exercise and you're well stimulated and okay, you're a happy dog and then you're tired, you come home, you sleep. Whereas, you know, if you're inside a house for 99% of the time, you have your short little 10 minute walk, you have a teeny little itch on the skin. It's like, oh, I'm going to scratch that. Um, or for instance, e even these, there's a skin lesion called a lick granuloma where these dogs lick the front of their paws. Um, I'm used to see it in Dobermans all the time. And that is specifically can be just linked to anxiety. So if you can lower these dogs, like all of a sudden get them outside more often and or you might even use in that situation an anti-anxiety treatment, conventional or, or holistic, often that's one of the treatments for say these lick granulomas. So yeah, they're, yeah, there's no question they're, they're correlated for sure. And it's like you said, if you can like, especially if you can deal that, deal with that in a more holistic way, it's so much better than, you know, getting your dog on some anti-anxiety medication too, right? Yeah. I didn't, I didn't realize they were using anti-anxiety medication for allergies. That makes sense though, why they would see some positive results. That's interesting. Um, a couple other things that I do for my dogs, because again, I had I have a Labrador who used to struggle really bad with all kinds of uh, allergies. A couple of things that's worked for us. Uh, we use an in-home, I have an, like an air filter in my home because I researched a while, while ago. Yeah, uh, I think it was the EPA that said that our indoor air quality can be up to 100 times worse than outdoor air because it's all typically our windows are closed and everything's more concentrated, which you you talked about before. So I like to use an air filter, but then also let fresh air in, even in the winter when I can. Um, we use water filters. I, I know a lot of places have really high quality tap water where I live, we do not. So I my dogs get uh, filtered water as, as do I. And one thing I love giving supplement wise uh, is like a raw goat milk, raw goat kefir, just because it is, um, has healthy fats, healthy digestive enzymes, healthy uh, probiotics, which you talked about. So that gut health, those are just a couple things uh, that have worked uh, really, really, really well for me. And then I think the final thing for me, just to share, because we've talked about immune immunity, we've talked about uh, inflammation. And one thing that's important to me is when I'm feeding a diet for my dogs, I like feeding one that's a lower carbohydrate amount as possible because excessive carbohydrates can in many dogs lead to more inflammation. So those are just a couple things that I've found to be good for allergies, but also overall general health for my dogs. Makes sense. It's always much the same with us as many of the thoughts, right? Is how we feed yeah. ourselves, right? Because we sure wouldn't live off of our, all of our food being in a shape of a kibble and that's all we eat for the rest of our lives and be healthy. I know, right? Like it's 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 insane that dogs are the only mammals that were like they need to eat one thing, same thing their entire life, whole all life stages. Like it just doesn't it doesn't really make sense. Um, and when you really dig into it, and you learn that kibble's only about a hundred years old, and mm -hmm. you just realize like, oh wait, what did dogs eat before? <laughs> and wow, they don't really need that all the time. So, um, one kind of the last topic. And I know that this could be a whole nother video. And if there's enough interest, maybe we'll do another video together on this. But it's been uh, circling around a lot around around pet food, specifically grain free or grain inclusive as it relates to the heart condition or heart disease, DCM. And it's starting to get a lot more popularity. So I just want to get kind of your thoughts, your kind of quick take on DCM, grain free, what should I be worried about? What should, should I even be worried about it? And, uh, you know, what should I be watching out for, if anything? So the, the first thanks for asking, Rachel. So the, the FDA did uh, their most recent update at the end of 2022. And they said they first published a report 2018, a link between what they said at the time was certain types of grain-free dog foods and this type of heart disease, DCM, dilated cardiomyopathy. It's a type of heart disease that typically veterinary wise in practice, we'd only see in a number of different breeds. It had a clear genetic correlation. And for instance, when I brought Doberman retrievers, for instance, I was like, oh, okay, that was a breed where we would, six, we would see this type of heart disease, but really it always seemed to have some, for the most part, this genetic link. Where this all of a sudden this showed up 2018, I'm like, okay, that's a huge thing. If there's 
dogs getting this type of heart disease related to diet. And the FDA at the time then went on to actually name you know, 16 brands linked link to this. But at the time, they only listed about 500 dogs out of you know 75 million dogs in the US. Since their most recent update at the end of 2022, they said in total, they can link 1400 dogs to develop, have developed this type of heart disease related to diet. In their last update, they also said that it has been both grain and grain-free foods, not just grain-free dog foods. But what they have said is there seems to be the biggest correlation to the legumes, but in particular the peas, chickpeas, and lentils. Those are the top three. And some some of the universities have done retrospective studies and said they they haven't actually found a specific. Some one of the universities that didn't find a correlation at all said. You know, this is really overblown. The incidence is tiny if there is even a change in incidence. But other universities such as Tufts have done some of their own studies. And what they've come to the conclusion is sort of my thought is that there is a link in some teeny fraction of dogs between diet and this type of heart disease, dilated cardiomyopathy. And in particular, the single biggest breed that's been affected is golden retrievers. I mean, they're a breed that we never used to see this type of heart disease before, and they ha and that has been linked to diet. So there is a, a small percent of dogs. And if and it seems to be the single biggest ingredient that's linked to that is peas. But peas, then chickpeas, then lentils. So my general thought in that, most dogs, if your dog's been doing great on a certain diet, you don't need to rush out and change it. But if I... If I were to have a golden retriever, my general thought is I would try to avoid, you know, peas, chickpeas, lentils, if that's all I'm going to feed them all the time, right? They eat it some, like Tula's had, you know, some of her food, she has his instinct. It's got, yeah. it's got peas and chickpeas in there as part of the food. And, right, and I'll feed her that, but I know I rotate that food. So the issue is more if you feed one type of food all the time, long term. So my general thought is, is it an issue? It is. Is it something most people need to be worried about? No. And my one last takeaway is you don't nest if, if you can, just don't be feeding, you know, those, especially those big three ingredients, peas, chickpeas, lentils, you know, all the time, like where you're going to rotate it out or just feed less of them. And I think if you sort of follow its principles, you're not going to have an issue with your dog. Yeah. I, I couldn't agree more with everything that I've read. And as you said, the, the FDA came out very quietly, um, just a couple yeah. months ago, and said, "Oh, we actually find no correlation to these diets and and DCM." So, oops. <laughs> um, right. So, and, and and so I think you know, it's not to say that there's no risk, but I, I know you did a video where you showed the percentage, uh, a potential yeah. percentage, and it was like point oh 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 one percent chance of getting that. Exactly. In the, yeah. Yeah. The the chances is infinitesimal. Where if you look at Say, for instance, a whole bunch of different conventional drugs, for instance, and you look at their side effects, it's massive, right? By comparatively to something like that. So, yeah, it's on, yeah. Yeah. And I think it, it, it's, it's wild to me because there was just this big uproar about DCM. And, you know, again, I'm, I'm glad that we're, we're all paying attention to this, but if you look at the instance is so low, but then we look at something like cancer, like canine cancer and like, some one in three, one in two dogs will get cancer. It's, it's millions of dogs, 16,000 dogs a day, according to the NIH, are diagnosed with cancer. Um, that's, that's like epidemic levels. And that's like, why is that not all over the news? Um, and, you know, I have my call it conspiracy theories on that. But I mean, think about like, you know, what fuels mm. cancer cells? Sugar and <laughs> carbohydrate filled high foods filled with carbohydrates converting to sugar. These big pet foods probably don't want that on the the big mainstream. So that's a, that's a that's you know I digress, but I, I agree mm -hmm. with you, and I think that when I think about heart disease, because it was a lack of what taurine. I mean that comes from yeah. meat. So for me. Yes. When this first came out, I was thinking, why is this a conversation of grain versus grain free? This should be a conversation of meat. But the problem is, is most of the or a lot of the popular traditional kibble out there is really low in protein from meat. They're getting the protein from the legumes or the soy or the wheat gluten. So mm -hmm. if, if we're just feeding, if we go back to what you and I were talking about, feeding these 
fresher food options and high meat diets, which dogs are biologically meant to eat, it, we're setting them up for success. There really shouldn't be a worry. No, they didn't. It's funny because I don't think they recorded a single case of DCM linked to a dog eating more food. Yeah. As an example, which, right. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So to, to, thank you for, thank you for yeah. that. I know that's a, that's a hot topic, but I really value your opinion and your experience in that. Um, now my question, my last question for you is what, if there was one wish that you had, if, if you, if there was, if, what is one thing you wish all pet parents knew? One thing I wish all pet parents knew, but at the very least is your dog is going to get sick, but you're the one ultimately who's in charge. So you're the one who like can ultimately make the health decisions for your dog. So yes, you go see your veterinarian, your dog is sick. They do an exam, maybe you, but then you start asking questions about diagnostics and what is this diagnostic going to lead to? And they might suggest treatment and you ask questions about this treatment, is there an alternative treatment? And you're involved, so you do a bit of your own research as well. So you're just being engaged and involved in asking questions. Because, I mean, ultimately, it's your dog and your choice. And I, I can relate with myself in practice. I mean, clients who ask the most questions, like when they were really asking questions about, like, what do you think my dog has? Could he have this or this? Yes, he could. What are the options for treatment? And if we do this, what are the side effects? Like, ask all those questions. And, all. I mean, even with my own experience, I always was definitely more forthcoming with those clients. And really, that... Ultimately, I think those dogs got better care, especially when the pet parents were more involved with, okay, can we try this or do this? And like, yes, you can. So yeah, be that person. It's fine. Be like the pain in the butt because yeah. right, you know, ultimately your dog deserves that. Absolutely. And I believe that nobody knows your dog better than you. And mm -hmm. to add on that, what I always tell my community is that uh, don't be afraid to get a second opinion. Like if your veterinarian is recommending or suggesting something and you ask questions and, and you're just not quite comfortable with it, I personally feel like it's more than okay to seek a second opinion. Um, and for me, I personally look for veterinarians that are like Dr. Jones, more integrative or holistic focused. And at least in the U.S., you can search um, – AHVMA, American Holistic Veterinarian Medical Association. They have a great find a vet section. So that's a great resource to start. And a lot of vets now, which is exciting, are doing telehealth, like online vet consultants and stuff, which Dr. Jones, I know you're not necessarily doing that, but you have so much content out there that people can basically learn everything you have to know um, just by following you and, and watching your, your videos. Nice. So with that, thank you so much for uh, joining. Honestly, it's an honor. I have been, I've learned so much from you and I respect what you're doing. And I know that what you do is very difficult because you're going for pun intended against the grain uh, in the industry, but you're doing it for the benefit of our pets. So thank you for that. And then again, for anybody watching, please make sure that you go follow Dr. Jones, um, check out his website. It'll all be linked down below. Show him love and um, share this video because I think this will really help uh, tons and tons of pet parents. So thank you all for joining. <laughs>